Welcome. We be Utah. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that all of us, together, each and every one of us, whether you're a Mormon or Jehovah's Witness, whether you're, oh, I don't know, a Calvary Chapel like Salt Lake City or up in the north like Wasatch, can't think of the name of it, Wasatch something or Mountain something in the south, whether you're once were a Calvary Chapel and you've assembled yourself together with someone else's ministry or whether you're a person like me who God is using outside of maybe the organized church in a way that might be a little frustrating to some, might be a little aggravating to others, but no matter how you look at it, all of us, if we live today in the state of Utah, dare I say, we be Utah. That's what the motto is for here in this study, that we examine the facts, the fallacies, some of the topics, and those issues that I find that we in Utah have to deal with in some peculiar way. In some ways, this is kind of my way of expressing or talking about the frustrations I have, sometimes with my own fellow believers, sometimes with those that are in the church, of the church, by the church, and dare I say, for the church. Now, I pray, I talk to Jesus, I have a personal relationship with God, I have developed this relationship by Him working in me over these 40 years so that often what I see and what I talk about are those things that I know based upon the wisdom of the years and the ages that God has taken me through in understanding humanity and such as it is applying the grace that is needed to talk to and address certain topics that I'll tell you straight up evangelicals Christians Mormons people inside the church don't want to talk about sometimes well if we're in Utah we have to deal with everyone and you can't lie to anyone so what we want to do in Weeby, Utah is tell the truth. We want to examine the way. We want to follow Jesus today in such a way that we can say, this is the truth. You may not like it. You may have to deal with your own preconceived misconceptions or disinformation and misinformation, or even some of the things that you think are true, and then have to go back and ask God. But here's what we base Weeby, Utah on. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who abradeth not, but give it to all men liberally. This is spoken of in James chapter 1, verse 5. And the reason why it's given by James is because James made a mistake. James made a big boo-boo. He made one of the biggest errors of his life. He denied his brother being the Son of God. James, that's written in the book of James, is in fact the brother of Jesus. He is someone who grew up with Jesus, saw Jesus, knew Jesus, and rejected Jesus. We know that. He oftentimes, even with his own brothers and sisters, wanted to go and grab Jesus and lock him up. As a matter of fact, today, Jesus, if James was around, would have committed Jesus to an insane asylum. And maybe got away with it. Maybe not. We know here in Weeby, Utah, that there are sects of the Mormon church that get away with doing things. We know there are people inside the Mormon church that get away with doing things. We know there are people in politics that get away with doing things. Just like in Calvary chapels, where I come from, there are people getting away with doing things that just twist my whiskers. They do things that are so contrary to what Calvary chapels taught and were about that I often say, well, how do they get away with it? Well, because Calvary chapels aren't what you think they are. They're a loose assembly, and getting looser all the time, of people that grew up learning about the Bible, discovering and sometimes going out and starting churches that they would assemble themselves under the name Calvary Chapel, but it doesn't mean they are technically the same as what was once called Calvary Chapel. And I say that by way of reference because today we're going to talk about one of the Calvary Chapels, but all kinds of other Calvary chapels that I've seen them doing the same thing. And today's topic in Weeby, Utah is gifts of the Spirit. Now, uh, 
I can't tell you what I don't know. I can't explain to you anything I haven't seen with my own eyes. I can't describe for you anything that I haven't heard with my own ears. I can only tell you what I've seen, what I've heard, and what I've handled with my own hands. And when I went to Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa over 40 years ago, about 40, almost exactly 40 years ago, I sat in a class taught by Romaine. It was called the, let's see, I don't think it was called School of the Bible, but it was on Wednesday night where they had Bible classes. I don't think it was called School of the Bible. Bible school wasn't called that either. But it was the early days prior to Calvary getting the Teachers Conference Center and then that later becoming at first the early Bible college and then later it grew into other things. But I remember being in Romaine's class. I remember studying with Romaine there teaching a Bible class on Wednesday night. Amazing, huh? And he was teaching through the book of Acts the gifts of the Spirit. He was teaching about the Spirit of God. And if I can sum up the entire class, it was simply this. You don't know all the gifts. You don't know what gifts are operating. You don't know the Holy Spirit, but as best as you understand, God will reveal to you. He said, quote unquote, you can have all the gifts, and at times, most of the time that you see in the book of Acts, all the gifts are operating, or quite a few of them. And so he went through the entire book of Acts, showing us how one person might say this is one gift, and then he would explain how there's more operating there. And it was a fascinating, in-depth study, not only into the gifts of the Spirit, but sometimes into the mind of Ruane. I mean, my God, this guy was pretty intense if you ever studied with him, if you ever listened to him, if you ever talked to him. He was pretty straightforward. I mean, you didn't make a mistake about what he was saying any more than James, whom I compare to Romaine in some ways because Romaine loved the book of James. James is saying in James 1.5, if you lack wisdom, ask God. And that's what I got out of Romaine. Romaine oftentimes in his relationships would tell us stories, especially on Thursday studies when he was teaching on the Thursday morning studies at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. He would talk about how people would come in for counseling and he'd have this all set up in his mind and then God would talk to him and say, no, don't do that, do this. And He talked like he had a personal relationship with Jesus, much like most people in the early days of the Jesus movement did have and do have, and today most of them do, have a personal relationship with Jesus that Jesus talks to them. Now, for some of you that aren't part of Calvary Chapel, you may kind of be, you know, going, what do you mean he talks to you? You mean you read it in the Bible and then you make it fit? Well, no, some Calvary chapels do that today. Some people that have been taught some inductive study go about teaching and preaching and acting like they hear from God because they take a part of Scripture and they make a personal application of it by principle, not by personage. Meaning this, the principle applies, but the person of Jesus saying it to that individual doesn't. Now, Calvary chapels, technically, especially on pastors, radio programs, which I hate and I don't recommend, but they'll come out with something that's general, with a general idea for somebody calling in, you know, to a radio show, and they can't really see the person, but they'll talk to the person and try to address an issue in generalities. So they'll say, well, you know, the scripture isn't by personal interpretation. Well, no, it's not by personal interpretation, but it's by spiritual application of the Spirit of God using severally as he chooses to apply it to the person. You see, we here at Vidival Church know that. We know what it means, personal interpretation. Joseph Smith has a personal interpretation of the Bible, and then he went out and started a religion about it. Well, personal application is different. The Spirit of God makes fit the Word of God to your life in a way that only He can do, and then He is accountable and responsible for fulfilling it the way He chooses to do in your life. And that's how you interact with God in a personal and demonstrative way. It is a way that is obvious to the viewer that you can see that the Spirit of God is leading that person. Not just because of the fruit being that it's peace, love, or joy, because sometimes Peace, love, and joy come out of the breaking thereof of the fruit and squishing it to produce wine. And then when you drank a little wine, guess what? You're a little more joy-filled. I won't explain that whole teaching, but the point being is this. The fruit of the Spirit isn't a direct application of how you tell someone's led by the Spirit of God. You tell by, eventually, God reveals it, as James 1.5 says. Because, you see, man looks on the outward things, but God looks on the heart. And the reason why we're saying all this is because locally there's a church 
and I won't say the name specifically, you know, but it's here in Salt Lake City, so you can already figure it out, that um, is teaching on the gifts of the Spirit, and the way they're advertising it is, find your gift, use your gift for the church. Wow. Now, if you do a study on the gifts of the Spirit, you'll see that the Holy Spirit gives gifts severally as He chooses. The Holy Spirit does cause people to be anointed or appointed and then laid hands on of anointing for certain offices in the church, meaning like apostles and prophets and teachers and pastors and leaders and all kinds of things that I'll be honest with you too. You know, when the church, when people outside the church look at the church, they say, well, that doesn't really make sense to me. And I'll agree with them. Yeah, you're right. It doesn't make sense. And I agree that you're right and they're probably wrong. Because oftentimes Jesus even said the same thing, like when the centurion came up to him and Jesus wanted to make a lesson of faith, and he says the centurion tells Jesus, look, I'm a man under authority, all you got to do is say the word and I know my servant will be healed. And so Jesus says, wow, I've never found so much faith in all of Israel as this Gentile Roman centurion demonstrating what faith really is. God said it, I believe it, let's do it. Bingo, done. And that's what we mean by when we say that the Spirit of God has to do it rather than man doing it. Because man would have looked at the centurion and said, no, God can't use him. God doesn't, you know, speak through opposites, you know, of what is righteous. We need to go find a righteous Christian to tell us what's true rather than sometimes God not able to use them and have to go outside even to the point of Balaam's donkey or jackass being used to warn Balaam. Hey, if a centurion is what God wants to use, a centurion is what God will use. The same thing was true when Joseph went down into Egypt, you know, or Abraham went down into Egypt, and then the unrighteous Pharaoh says, look, why are you getting me in trouble with your God? I got enough problems with my own God. But why don't you, why didn't you just tell me the truth in the first place instead of lying? And that's why we confront things here in Weeby, Utah. I don't want you to confront someone. I don't want you to affront someone in their faith, growing and learning as they're going, you know, and trying to adapt to what the Spirit of God is doing individually in their life. But I have to affront and confront certain facts that are false when they're being presented in a negative way and are a lie that is technically what it is, is that sometimes the end result of what some Calvaries do may be good. God may steer them or use them in spite of themselves. I know that Joel Osteen, you know, is probably one of the big examples where people say, oh man, there, nothing good can come out of that. Well, yes it can, because the Calvary chapels used to say that about TBN. You know, I mean, it used to be like, you can't watch Christian television because an example of it was PTL Club, TBN, and CBN. And frankly, you know, you, Christian broadcast, yeah, CBN. So, Nowadays, CBN's still around, TBN's still around, well, PTL Club's gone, you know, and so the bottom line is that God will sometimes cause people to get saved anyways, just like in the Crystal Cathedral, we used to complain about, hey, the drive-in, you know, the drive-in pastor, the drive-in preacher who you used to be able to go through the drive through you know, and get a blessing or a prayer, well, he built the Crystal Cathedral, you know, and a lot of Calvary Chapel pastors came out of that ministry, you know, and they started there, got saved there, but they went on to something else. Well, that's what I'm approaching the subject of when we talk about in Weeby, Utah, when we address certain churches that maybe, you know, they can do what they want to do inside their own walls, but when they go on the internet and start preaching it or teaching it in such a way, even if it's an invitation that I have to say, hey, whoa, let's talk about truth versus supposition. Let's talk about fact versus fallacy. Let's talk about the reality of the gifts of the Spirit. Now, there's a popular teaching and popular books and a lot of things in Christianity that are done in order to make you easier to follow Jesus. Jesus didn't make it easy to follow him, but, you know, I mean, that's just something that, you know, right now they want to do in a state that they don't want to confuse you, so they want to somehow make it easier for you to Hey, leave, you know, the Mormon church behind. Well, I got news for you. The Mormon church is going to be used by God in the Great Tribulation. So I don't have a problem with that. We'll talk about that in another segment of Weeby Utah. But in this segment, we're talking about my home stomping grounds that I know what I talk about. And so by the Spirit of God to the people of God or the Son of God, Jesus, we want to reveal the truth about what the Spirit is saying to this address of the issue of having a class to discover your gift.
false. Let me just be straight up right up right off the bat. That statement in and of itself is totally false. It's totally bizarro, it's wacko, it's satanic, it's not even in the Bible. Nowhere does it say discover your gifts. As a matter of fact, I don't see anywhere when Jesus tells the uh, disciples to go wait and tarry in Jerusalem until you receive power on high. He says, hey, go discover what your gift is once you're up there in the upper room because guess what, you know, we got to have, you know, all these gifts in operation for the church to be effective. Otherwise, it's like the church walking on one leg or two legs, you know, and not really effective. You got to get your gifts so that we can put you and pigeonhole you into the position that we want you to have because after all, the church isn't as strong as it is when it's all assembled together. It sounds good. Sometimes it works good, but in the long run, is it good? Now, Jesus said, don't call any man good except your Father in heaven. And I'm kind of like, yeah, I'm with that all the way. Because what I've seen as sounding good often is false. What I've seen as thinking they're doing good often turns out to be, you know, so wrong. They don't admit they were wrong in the first place, but because they can, God can turn something upside down and turn it around, they go, well, you know, now that we're here, oh, okay, Never mind what we did to get here, but oh, okay. Because you see, in Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, I know, and I've seen it behind the scenes, lots of wrong that, you know, oh boy, you know, there's some bad stuff happening sometimes behind the scenes. But God still used anyways. Just like at the Crystal Cathedral. God used, even though it was like kind of, you know, I wouldn't want to throw stones at a glass house, but, you know, they don't, they're not there anymore. And just like Calvary Chapels that now are, drying up or sometimes or they fail in their ministry or they fail in what they say even one pastor i know that i watched grow from his first stepping out of ministry to the end of his retirement which he's not retired anymore he's back in ministry but he's not a calvary chapel and i can understand why i wouldn't say that he was one but in the years that he was you know he taught certain things and did certain things that in and of itself it was obvious that his office was he was probably the most dynamic powerful worship leader I've ever seen and when it came to children's ministry dynamic but when it came to be a pastor he sucked I mean a lot of people liked him for his evangelism but then again when you're childlike you know you can have certain gifts in operation that as in fulfilling in the office of an evangelist you could accomplish much but that doesn't mean you're called and anointed to be an evangelist now I would have said this man should go off in evangelism because he's very good in worship or to be a worship leader, or to be a children's pastor. But to be a pastor, I've watched him over the years flip-flop, 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 flip-flop. And he's always starting a new ministry. I would assume that kind of like gives you a hint, if he's still doing it over and over and over and over and over again, it kind of sounds like a flip-flop thing, you know? And his theology is, you know, it's good, but what is anointed and what is appointed is different than what is, quote-unquote, God doing. Now, I say that because Chuck Smith used to say, hey, you know, if the Holy Spirit is leading you some way, go that way. You know, we'll watch you, you know, we'll see what you're doing, you know, we'll, we'll evaluate it, and you know, if the Lord's telling us to do it, we'll do it. You know, Vineyard is a great example of that, you know, I mean, John Wimber went off, you know, didn't agree with the direction that Chuck was taking or that the Holy Spirit was leading Chuck in, in promoting the worship and the word together, you know, and having the word set up for the worship or however you want to look at it, that now evangelicals are doing, you know, and imitating but never giving credit where it came from, but that's okay. But the point is the Jesus movement brought that out because at the time of the Jesus movement, I mean, even evangelical churches and the magazines and everything were saying God was dead. Where did the Holy Spirit go? He wasn't there anymore. So he operated outside the church and exploded everywhere, not just Calvary's, but also, you know, like Colorado's with, you know, like, you know, uh, I can't think of it, but um, went to New York and started the church, you know, and then he eventually became a prophet and all that kind of stuff. But anyways, the point being is this. The Spirit of God is the one that is in control. The Spirit of God is the one that is here in existence right now in these latter days. The Spirit of God is what we deal with daily when we talk about reading the Word and we say you should pray and read or you should operate as of this new quote-unquote bad theology, bad ideas going about saying you should operate in your gift, you know, and then go accordingly. Because they want you to be, you know, useful for them. Or for, they'll say, well, you just go wherever the Lord leads you. No. Say, so, yeah, right, you're already in the church, you know, and you're being kind of like, you know. And 
I know that in the charismatic movement, when I went to, um, at the time I was down at Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa, I went out to St. Edward's Church, which was a Catholic church that was having folk masses that were demonstrating the gifts of the Spirit, and they were operating in the gifts, and they would, on at nighttime, lay hands on Catholics, and they'd say, repeat after me, yabba dabba doo, and they'd go, yabba dabba doo, yabba dabba dooey, yabba dabba dooey, hey, you got the gift of tongues, woo, no fooey, Huey. I mean, ouch, it was a little weird. Now, I can tell you maybe one or two, because they didn't just go yabba dabba dooey, but they went, way off and they probably got the gift of the Holy Spirit you know I mean baptized the Holy Spirit and they got the gift of tongues and went off on whatever I don't know I only know that that wasn't exactly what you should be doing you know repeating after me like most people do when they say they have the gift of tongues if you can find the gift of tongues in a person and he's saying the same thing that TBN is saying I got news for you that ain't your prayer language that ain't the gift of tongues that's imitation and boy have you gone off the reservation but the fact of the matter is, Paul said, hey, I got more than all of you, you know, and that's what Romaine taught us. You know, don't get into this thing about the gift or about the, the office or about this, that, or the other thing. Let God do it. Then you don't got to worry about it. And I went, I actually asked him one time, I said, well, then why do we go to class? And he grinned at me. You know, like, you got it. Why? You know, if God's the one teaching you, so if you got that part, you don't need it. You know, it's like, well, okay. And I kind of learned that from Calvary a lot. I'd go up and ask them, and they would tell me, well, you got it. You know, you don't got to worry about it. You know what I mean? God's talking to you, so do what he tells you to do. And that's why our motto at Video Church really is that. So, you know, on the one hand, I want to clarify and give a disclaimer. If God told that Whoever he is, he, they say Calvary chapels waste the word pastor, so I don't like to call them pastors. If whoever it is that's leading that class, God told him to do it, go do it. For whatever witness it becomes, I don't know. It could be a witness for, you know, and used by God, or it could be a witness for me starting this and doing this, or whatever reasons God uses. I don't know the end results. I'm only saying the teaching itself or the leading of thereof of trying to make people get their gift is false. No, that's not how you get a gift. A gift is given to you by grace. Just like grace is a free gift, the gifts of the Spirit are the same. You get baptized the Holy Spirit, believe me, God will take care of the rest. You don't have to look for your gift, find your gift, operate your gift, demonstrate your gift, practice your gift, and do all that kind of junk. That's junk, buddy. You know, you're out of your mind. Now, let me explain something from A.W. Tozer who addresses, really, not just Calvary Chapels, but the entire evangelical movement. He called himself a prophet of God, and a lot of people don't like to use that word prophet because then they think of Pentecostal. I personally don't like people that say they're a prophet because usually when I read their stuff or I watch their life, I kind of, I mean, I don't look at their life, but, you know, I watch what they're doing with their stuff that they're promoting, and I can say, hey, that's no prophet. I can prove to you that by scripture, you know, and if it's a prophet, it'll come exactly like they say. Tozer, that's different. I'd have to admit, even as he said, he's a minor prophet. I agree with him. Wow, what a life, you know. But Tozer has an interesting statement I want to read to you so that you know where we're coming from and then where we're going. And I know it's been a little long-winded, but that's what we do at Weeby Utah. We want to make sure we cover the bases, you know, so that you understand I'm not knocking you going to this church or talking you into not going to the class. I'm just telling you why it's wrong or why it's false. Now, if God sends you there for whatever reason, you may learn about things that are false and may be there just to learn that it's false. Hey, praise the Lord. But as the Spirit of God leads you, not as you are deceived into thinking you're going to get your gift from it. Sorry, that is false. Bible taught or spirit taught? It may shock some readers to suggest that there is a difference between being Bible taught and being spirit taught. Nevertheless, it is so. It is altogether possible to be instructed in the rudiments of the faith and still have no real understanding of the whole matter. And it is possible to go on to become expert in Bible doctrine and not have spiritual illumination, with the result that a veil remains over the mind, preventing it from apprehending the truth in its spiritual essence. Now, that in and of itself means technically that you need to be recognizing that it's possible to be so wise like Solomon and yet not have spiritual eyes to see what it is that the Spirit of God wants to reveal. 
it's possible to look in the Bible every day and read it every day and not get anything out of it. By the way, you know, speaking of that, that's why the idea of the Bible says is so false. The Bible says, but how does the Spirit of God apply it in my life is more important. How is the Spirit of God revealing it in your life and does it apply to my life? Is the Spirit of God saying something to the nation as opposed to just the person or the momentary inspiration or in most ways perspiration? Because even in Calvary chapels, there's a lot of Calvaries that are like dynamic as far as doctrine. They know their doctrine. I mean, they, you know, they get the idea that they understand it from Genesis to Revelation and they'll dogmatically walk their way through it. Some of them. Some of them will bounce around but still kind of do, you know, the line upon line, precept upon precept. I got news for you. The prophet in, uh, I think it's Mike in, um, I want to say Mike, it's not Micah, but in um, Malachi, I'm pretty sure it's Malachi. But you could look it up and figure it out with your own little, you know, if you got your digital thing, look it up. But it says, line upon line, precept upon precept. Line upon line, line upon line. The prophet was saying, you say line upon line, but that's not what it is, you know. And, God, in one hand, does honor, you know, us studying the Word of God by way of looking and reading and understanding and trying to get something out of the line upon line, book upon book, chapter, chapter, book, you know, and in order, some order. But that's all not really in order. I mean, to put it bluntly, that's somebody else's opinion of how to put together. The words themselves sometimes are a little bit, mm, you know, but sometimes even the chapters are a little messed up or the verses are a little kind of like quasi, you know, like, where do they go? But the reality is that God knows his own word. You don't have to be there to tell him what he knows. But rather, we should be listening to the Spirit of God as he leads us. You don't have to go into some kind of inductive way and then say, well, I need to add like seven scriptures, you know, so that I can apply this to that. And then I can take the people from here to there. And then that applies to that. And this goes to this. And that goes to that. And bounce them around throughout the Bible, you know, and in some kind of inductive way. That's really a deductive study of what you are learning inductively to apply to your life that you wanted to apply to other people's lives. I mean, it's not really an inductive study. It's deductive. But we weren't going to get into the depth of logic and what the words actually mean. We are told by evangelical, quote unquote, lately, Bible publishers that that's inductive Bible study. <laughs> you may want to re-look at that, you know, from a logic point of view. But okay, hey, I don't mind, you know, whatever title you want to give it. But what we're talking about from Tozer is spirit taught. What if you're sitting in a Bible study like I was, you know, underneath uh, somebody's tutelage, you know, Chuck Smith, and I was literally sitting at his feet because I was down in front, you know, on the gr on the on the carpet, you know, I mean, I used to run up front, you know, on Sundays so that I could get way down up front, you know, just kind of lay out there, you know, and look at my Bible. Well, Chuck starts talking, you know, and you know how he's got that sing-song voice, and he'd get into something, and if I was interested, I'd follow along. If not, I'd look at the Bible, all of a sudden God was going, you know, and the Bible would flip by its pages by itself. No, I moved them, but God would show me, and it would stand out like a big, bold thing, and I'd be going, you know, flipping through. Now, Chuck never looked down. If he did, I would have, you know, like, frozen terror. But, no, I mean, you know, it was just God was showing me something, and I went off on a tangent studying, you know, and it wasn't every time, but sometimes. And that's what being spirit-taught means. It means yielding yourself, of yourself, to how God wants to reveal himself to you. That's what we mean by the volume of the book, it's written of Jesus. If you don't, like, quite let go and let God then you don't know where it is and what it is that God might be wanting to reveal to you so you do know. And that's why we claim or we state to you what you can know from James 1.5. If you don't know, you can ask God so you do know. In other words, you don't have to go through some guy's opinion that he's going to either lay hands on you or pray for you or, you know, give you a, which is the worst thing in the world. If you get a spiritual test to find out what your gift is, give it a rest. Can I tell you that? It's false. It's absolutely intellectualism and doctrine and dogma to the nth degree that has nothing of God in it. God doesn't give you a quiz to find out who you is. No offense, but he doesn't. What God does is he chose 12 disciples. Now, Jesus went aside to pray. Now, what that means, he went aside to talk to his father. He talked to God, God talked to him in the same way that he went up on the Mount of Transfiguration. And when he was there, his 
glory or his image or his visage was changed and he was shining bright and there was Moses and Elijah and he's talking to them and it says about the end times or something. I forget how it goes. But the point is he was talking to them. There is conversation when it comes to God. God the Father speaking. Whom shall we send? Well, hey, send me. You know, and there's David or I think it was David. You know, I got to think about Isaiah probably, but I can't remember right now. But... You know, there's somebody over-listening the conversation and writes it down. God talking to God about whom they're going to send. And Jesus says, hey, send me. You know, no. here am I, send me. You know, and it also applies locally to who the person that was doing it. And later on, we know that there's other people that have said, here am I, send me. But the fact of the matter is, God has conversation. God has communication. God has a direct relationship he wants you to have. Hey, shall we deny Abraham what we're about to do? Jesus says, as he was then incarnate in some way, to Abraham you know, sitting there at the tent, and they're eating together, and then he goes ahead and says, hey, you know, you fed me, you know, you, you welcomed me into your tent, you know, we've been in the shade, now let's talk about what we're doing here, you know, this is what we're doing, shall we, shall we tell them? So Abraham has a conversation, and intercedes on behalf of Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. So the reality of what God wants to do isn't about, hey, you go get a gift and run with it, baby, because it's your gift, and you got it, and you go. Because you can't abuse the Spirit of God. You can confuse that with which God has given you. You can use, abuse, and do's with what you want to do when you got to go to get something that you think you get from man, when in reality God says, look, i got a plan, but you got to follow what I say with it every day of your life. you got to talk to me and walk with me because I will be a whispering in your ear. I will be a still small voice. I will tell you to turn to the left or the right. I will show you how what is wrong and what is right. And that's why everything about Vittyville Church is about, hey, you get it from God, otherwise you don't go with it. Because until you know, don't go. Until you grow, don't flow. Until you know and grow and flow, hey, you won't show what it is that God wants to make a witness of you. So when we be Utah, we're going to talk about these issues all the time. They're going to come up things that I know the church down the street is the church down the street because they got such wacko stuff. They got Jesus underwear. I mean, we have a state that puts on holy underwear anyways. You know, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not against Mormons putting on, you know, vestments, you know, because the holy vestments that they get or they got or that they think that they've come up with really are from the Jewish tradition of putting on the talis katans, you know, which was just a kind of like an apron with little tzitzis tied on. The tzitzis are knots. The knots are tied in such a way to remind you of the, the law and the commandments. And this is the law and the commandments. Let me think. I'll think about this, you know, and kind of like, you know. Oh, yeah, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Beat yourself with it, you know, all thy soul. No, that's the Catholics. they got to flagellate themselves, you know, from the Talis Katan. They kind of get it from there. Believe it or not, it is. It's a long, drawn-out process of where they distort, abuse, and, you know, create some whack away of it. But that's where the Catholics get their flagellation. You know, the little straps that are down there. Well, i got to flick myself just like Jesus' 39 whips. Let me, let me smack myself around, you know, you know. But that's the flagellation of the Catholics. But the same thing is true about the Mormons when they come up with their holy underwear. They came up with this idea that somehow, you know, they put on these vestments and it keeps them, you know, pure and keeps reminding them of that with which, you know, they should be modest. Well, you know, I mean, the reason why Jews do it is totally different, but okay, if that's how they got it from Judaism, you know, fine. You know, and Joseph Smith wasn't ignorant of what he was doing or later on some of the doctrines and things he came up with, but he did get it from somewhere and he didn't get it from, you know, inspiration. He got it from using and changing something that came from Judaism. Well, I mean, to put it bluntly, that's the problem with down the street. Now they got from the Catholics this idea that they got a museum unto Jesus' underwear. You know, Jesus, holy sheep, you know. I mean, holy cow, we don't have holy cows, we got holy sheets. Holy sheets, they're like four, four sheets to the wind. They think that the Shroud of Turin is something that was, you know, wow, there was only one. Do you know how many times that they kept presenting things to the Catholic Church before they accepted, you know, that as being a relic, but not necessarily, you know, a actual one? And even the Catholic Church today won't admit that it's the actual Shroud, you know, of Jesus dying. No, there was, when it was first presented, there were seven of them. If Three of them, I think, the first time, then seven the second time. They were rejected, all of them, thrown out. You know, said, no, 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 no. Then later on, after I think it was five years, it got accepted in. They said, okay, we'll take this one. So they took one out of three. Where'd the other two go? And they hid it and kept it. And then the history of it, you know, because they got it on display down the church, down the street. You know, and that's where I kind of go, are you kidding me? Are you really that dumb? 
you know, in a state that already has holy underwear, you're going to make a shroud, you know, something that you want to talk about so that, you know, the Mormons could say this and you could say that and you both look the same. Dare I say, lost in your underwear. The emperor has new clothes. Hey, that's why there's so many ex-Mormons and, dare I say, so many people leaving down the street going to do something else, you know, because they don't want to be part of some things that are like a little cuckoo. So that's why in Weeby, Utah, we want to address those things and say, look, yeah, that's what they do, because if the heathen can see it, then so can you. And so I want you to know the truth so that you'll follow after Jesus, not after what men do. In this state, men do a lot of doo-doos. You know, they think they got to do something, and they go after imitation. It's kind of like down the street is just another offshoot of Sacramento. I mean, even the logo comes from Sacramento. I mean, I kind of went... Isn't that from Sacramento? And then I found out that the pastor comes from Sacramento. I went, okay, it's just a biker church. You know, and I said, well, it's good for bikers. And I watch it, you know, and I've listened to the teaching. And I went, doesn't do anything for me. My wife did, and I went, doesn't do anything for her. You know, so I was like, wow, praise the Lord. You know, I don't think that it's going to minister to us. So no offense, whatever they're doing, go do, you know. But no, as far as what I listen to, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, and then I've even asked the pastor one time about this classes. I said, hey, you know, why are you doing this class? You know, it's 50 bucks to join. Well, yeah, it's a little high. He admitted that. And I, and I said, well, then, you know, why? Well, the guy knows how to make money. Wow, that's a reason. And then I heard about this Gifts of the Spirit, and I said, you know, you don't put out a class for people to get a gift when we're told to seek the giver of the gift, not the gift. You don't put out a class to make people fit your cookie-cutter Christianity in order to find what it is they're looking for because you're appealing to what they're looking for. In reality, what you do is you allow for the Spirit of God to lead a person as you teach about the Son of God, Jesus, and let Him direct them as He chooses since He is the head of the church. It's not this idea, and there's a really bad mentality that's going on in some of the Calvaries and a lot of churches that it's like, well, Jesus is going on a far journey and he's leaving you to do your own devices. So, you know, go ahead, do whatever you want, you know, build your house, build your structure, build your barns, get bigger, better, and, you know, broader and wider and, you know, full of, you know, whatever, wheat and chaff or sheep and goats or whatever you're going to do. And then when he comes back, you know, he'll separate the sheep from the goats, you know, and he'll with this winnowing fork, you know, cut down the wheat from the chaff, you know, and they'll toss it in the air, and whatever's fruit is there, you know, and whatever you did good, you get blessed, whatever you didn't, it's the rest, you know, and it gets cast aside. Well, that's kind of what the Catholics said, you know, with John F. Kennedy, when he said, God's in a far distant place, you know, and we have to deal with, with our lives now, and God doesn't intervene directly, and specifically and personally. Well, the Master is gone, but the Spirit of God is here. In other words, Jesus is directly able to be contacted and spoken to and in communicado with us. That's why he said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me and they will not follow the voice of another. So in Weeby, Utah, I'm going to tell you, you know, like we always end this Weeby, Utah and begin it the same way. We have Mormons that are going to the Mormon church that are, hey, God bless you. If God's telling you to be a Mormon, go be a Mormon. But do you know Jesus? In other words... If you're building some foundation other than that which, which God has laid, that you don't know Jesus in a personal, intimate way, you're going to be misled by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Bottom line, they're men. They may be prophets, whatever. But you have to still examine what they're saying to see if it's true for you. You deal with God one-on-one, -on -one, and then God tells you where to go. If he tells, and he will tell some people, I know this because I had to go you know, get involved with Chabad, you know, which is a Jewish Orthodox group, you know, ministry up in Alaska. Because I went, Lord, nobody's going to believe me that you're sending me to Chabad not to witness. Because I got a job and I was used as the rabbi secretary, the administrative assistant. I walked around with the rabbi telling people why they couldn't shake his hand. I'm sorry, but the rabbi doesn't shake hands, you know, but, you know, it's just one of those, you know, religious things. That I, you know. And I took him around to different places to help get him started, you know, in his Jude Judaic Judaism ministry, and then as I was there with the Rebbitzin and the rabbi, you know, I, I saw some of the things they were doing. You know, they were taking evangelical Christian songs and rewording them to fit Judaism. I went, boy, I'll bet he doesn't know that it came from, you know, Praise 3, you know, album, 
or maybe he does and he's just using it anyways you know and it was like amazed me but that was god's confirmation to me of where i was at what i was doing but see i i don't have a problem with in weeby utah telling you if you're a mormon if god if you talk to jesus you know and you sat down and said you know jesus we gotta have a talk what's this born again you know and i understand that i'm born again but i'm not leaving the church and jesus says fine stay there then stay there go there be there now the church down the street will tell me I'm off the wall for saying that. No, I'm going to tell you as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, as First John says. That means, hey, if the Corinthians were as messed up as they were and they had gifts of the Spirit, I can tell you that the church down the street is pretty messed up in trying to tell you what kind of gift you got. Yeah, you might get something out of it, but believe me, they got no structure and discipline in order to understand what it is they're doing, even as Paul had to warn the Corinthians, look, if you're not full of love and you're using these gifts for something up, you know, out to lunch, sorry, dudes. And he wrote first and second Corinthians to warn the Corinthians, even though they got, oh, we got the spirit, but they went off without the spirit of God directing them, without the spirit of God inspiring every moment of their life. They weren't walking in the spirit, talking in the spirit, being led by the spirit. They were doing their own thing. And as you read Corinthians, you can pretty much figure that one out, you know, but hey, that's what churches do. So if the Corinthians could be that far off and then the Galatians pretty messed up and the Ephesians the way they were and then the Philippians, and then we get into the letters to the seven churches that don't involve Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Thessalonians, or any of those churches, but involve other churches that Jesus even said that, hey, you know, you're in my church, but you know, I'm knocking on the outside, I gotta talk to you. I don't have a problem telling some Mormon that, hey, you know what, if God's talking to you, you go for it. Or some Muslim that's, you know, finally getting a word from God, and God says, hey, you know this Jesus? This is my son. You know, And while he's still learning, he's still in the Islamic faith. I don't have a problem with that. God's telling him. But I do have an issue with this. You tell me God is speaking to you, and I will go, okay. You know, between you and Jesus, you decide. But I'll watch from a distance. I'll look. I'll say, well, you know, if it works for you, great. But I'm not applying it to my life. I'm not using it in my life. I have a personal relationship with Jesus. If God is telling you to tell me something, go ahead. But then I'm going to go ask God about it and say, uh, God, do you want me to do that? No, okay, I'm not doing it. You know, that easy. And that's the reality of why I say down the street. If that's what God is telling them to do, hey, they're down the street. they got to deal with whatever's down the street. I'm up the street. I don't have to deal with that because I only have to deal with what I saw what I've heard and what I've handled with my own hands. And as I've seen it presented, it's false. As I've seen it talked about, it's wrong. As I've seen it applied, I know that that's not what the Spirit of God does in the life of the believer. And I know because I know what Chuck Smith said and demonstrated as well as Romaine in their teachings because I was there. Now, it doesn't mean that they follow exactly what Chuck Smith says or Romaine or that that's a way of criteria that you, know, you should use. No. Because even John Wimber went off in Vineyard, I think it was a blessing for what they did and accomplished, and then they went off way off in Toronto, but hey, you know, God brought them back out of that, you know, I'm pretty sure some of them, most of them, maybe, hmm, could be, or like Trinity Broadcasting Network, you know, in the sense that, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, hunk of junk on Trinity, but Greg Laurie's back on there, and there's always been some kind of Calvary Chapel presence on TBN. And the reality that they do things behind the scenes you don't know about, as well as what the Crystal Cathedral did with so many being ministered to. So it's really not about just the fact of being able to say wrong, but it's like what isn't right is what I'm trying to say. Then you follow not what's wrong or what's right, but you follow Jesus in telling you in instructing you, in leading you in the way you should go. Because what makes a Christian a Christian is the fact that they are like Jesus. And what I mean by that in a Christian being a Christian, being like Jesus, is that the slam of what a Christian was was a slur word based upon those that were dying like Jesus died. It was easy to light up a Christian because all you had to do was throw some oil on them and put a torch to them and they would just rejoice and sing about it. Not like today where, you know, you tell me that a Christian is a Christian and the first thing he tells you is that, well, what if somebody breaks into your house? Are you going to let them light, light up and torch your wife? No, I'm going to do like the book of Acts, the same thing that they did there. They were lit up and torched and put into the Colosseum and even as Jesus warned in the letters to the seven churches, you will suffer persecution. 
So the fact of what American Christianity does with their guns and runs of the mouth, trying to make it about, you know, their own strength of might by putting their sword to the lives of people around them and trying to say, that's what Christians do. I'll say, no, you're wrong. You're full of it. You don't understand, rather, the volume of the book. You're looking at one temporary problem without an eternal solution. A guy breaks into my door, I'll say, hey, praise the Lord, I got prayers for you because I was praying that God would send someone to break in my door that would threaten my wife. So if you want to kill her, go ahead. If you want to kill me, go ahead. But I want to tell you about Jesus in the meantime, because whether you kill me or not, whether I live or not, whether I live or whether I die, it's because God brought you here so that I can tell you about Jesus. That's the fact, Jack, and that's what a reality of a Christian is. It isn't about killing or joining the military in order to slaughter someone, because that's just carnality. It's living in the world, of the world, and by the world. But what Jesus is doing is he's trying to set an example of the reality of what a life that is dedicated to him is all about. And what Jesus did in his life for only three and a half years, so don't, don't get it wrong, within his whole life he did this, but the part that we have recorded for us, the three and a half years, is he said, I only do those things that are pleasing to my Father. I do those things I see my Father telling me to do. I see those things my Father is doing in heaven. He didn't say he came to do his will, even in the Garden of Gethsemane when he finally said, look, I want to do my will and I don't want to go through this. But if this is it, not my will, thy will be done. And that's the reality of where you got to be today. In Weeby, Utah, you got to give up your will for his will. you got to quit looking at these programs that the church will always be about. There's always somebody that's going to pick up a book and say, hey, we're going to have a Bible study on this. By the way, give me $6.95 and you can join. By the way, give me $12.95 and you can be a part. Give me $50, bucks, you know, and I guarantee that you're going to make some money after you invest you know, in my pyramid scheme. Or, you know, worse than that, hey, come to our study so I can lay hands on you or I can tell you what your gift is. Don't be confused. Don't be used. Don't be abused. When the Spirit of God has clearly said to you through the Word of God about the people of God, of the Son of God, Jesus, that if you lack wisdom, you can ask God, who abradeth not, but giveth to all men verbally. That's all you got to do. When James was so wrong about his own brother that he's telling us now, don't bother with your own understanding, like in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, but rather ask God and he'll give you understanding, then I think we need to recognize that the early church made mistakes. The church down the streets make mistakes. You know, the church you go to, whether it's a Mormon or a Muslim or a Calvary or a Catholic or a Protestant or a or Vidigo Church or even my life as I live it, it's going to be about mistakes. I'm going to make mistakes, even as Abraham did, you know, and saying, hey, you know, let's let's take now, you know, um, uh, God, forget about my one son. I want my other son to be recognized. And God says, uh, I know about your other son, but take now thy son, thy only son, Isaac. But what about, you know, Ishmael? Oh, no, 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 no. That's your work. My work, I'll show you. And that's what we have to do when we are confused or misled or being taught something contrary to what the Bible says, but not just what the Bible says, but what God is speaking to you about at the moment you need to hear about what he wants you to do today. Because the Bible is always full of this one statement that I find very interesting. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. In other words, I know that there's people that don't hear his voice. I know there are people that use the Bible as said. I know there's a church down the street that uses programs and principles more than they'll tell you that God said. Because they're not going to stand up and say, well, the Lord told me today. Some of them will. Most of them won't. Because they're afraid of sticking their neck out and having it cut off by someone like me. But if they come to me and said, look, the Lord told me, I'd go, "Ho, whoa, you know, okay, praise the Lord. I don't care what you go from there about because the results of whatever the Lord told you is between you and him. But if God told you to do it, whatever it may be, I don't want to know it because you might come up with something off the wall and I'll go, oh man, are you sure? <laughs> but you know, hey, if God told you to take your only son, you know, up to a mountaintop and sacrifice him, don't tell me, please. Because, you know, God challenged Abraham on that one and I don't think he's challenging anyone nowadays, but I'm not going to go there. I'm not even going to get involved in it. You know, if you come to me and say, hey, you know, you know, I've been talking to Jesus. Jesus told me to go to the Mormon church and be a part of it. You know, I'll listen, 
But I'll say, well, okay, you know, I mean, if that's what the Lord's telling you, but, you know, I don't think you're going to get out of it what you think you're going to get by putting into it, but okay, if you do, praise the Lord, then God wants you there for a reason. And ask Him why He wants you there or what He wants you to do while you're there. I mean, because who knows, maybe you might become the next prophet of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and lead them unto great salvation in the great tribulation period. But I got news for you. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is definitely going into the Great Tribulation period. I know that. That's There is no question about that part. That's the easy one. They prepare for it. They expect it. They're doing it. I mean, you know, why else do you have all the food and water that you could imagine? But And then setting up temples everywhere so that they can all minister to each other. You know, I mean, come on now. That's what it's for. So, be careful. Follow what God tells you to do. Listen to the words that A.W. Tozer said about being Bible taught versus spirit taught. Most of us are acquainted with churches that teach the Bible to their children from their tenderest years and give them long instruction in the catechism, drill them further in pastor's classes, and still never produce in them a living Christianity nor a viral godliness. Their members show no evidence of having passed from death unto life. None of the earmarks of salvation so plainly indicated in the scriptures that are found among them. The religious lives are correct, and they are reasonably moral, but wholly mechanical and altogether lacking in radiance. They wear their faith as persons in mourning once wore black armbands to show their love and respect for the departed. Such persons cannot be dismissed as hypocrites because they believe what they believe in. Many of them are pathetically serious about it all. They are simply blind. For they lack of the vile spirit they are forced to get along with and the outward shell of faith when all the time their deep hearts are starving for spiritual reality and they do not know what is wrong with them. The great need of the hour among persons spiritually hungry is twofold. First, to know the scriptures, apart from which no saving truth will be vouchsafed by our Lord. And then the second, to be enlightened by the Spirit, apart from which the scriptures will not be understood. For if you think that you can read your Bible only, or you can listen to a pastor only, and then just accept what they have to say, you're deceived. You have to take what is being presented to you, and prove all things, and hold fast that which is good, and then ask God. God, what is in it for me? I mean... Don't get me wrong, that sounds narcissistic, but in spiritual matters, the reality of what God is speaking to you is for you to learn to trust Him with all that you do. So some narcissism in some way, what's in this for me, or what are you saying to me, is the fulfillment of the scripture that says, Today, if you hear His voice, harden not your heart, as it says in the provocation. Because down the street, I can tell you, if I come up and just say, look, let's talk. Let's walk together for this teaching and see whether or not we believe in it or whether or not it's a reality. Let's see if we can prove these things out and demonstrate whether or not they be of that with which God is telling you to do or whether they're just a good idea that you want to do. And the fact of the matter is, no, because a lot of churches will say, no, you go away and go do what you're doing. And so God gives me that availability of Weeby Utah to speak and address these things in such a way that you can examine what I said, go to the Bible, see what it says, listen to the Spirit of God, see what He says, talk to Jesus, see what He says, listen to your heart, ask God to do what He promised He would do, and then you can go forward whatever the Lord tells you to do. Because the video church, we're not against other people's doing what they're doing, but we're praying that you would be led not today by your flesh, but rather be led by the Spirit of God so you demonstrate the truth of God in the reality of everything that you see around you and prove out what God's word is as you live with Jesus day to day, every day that you find yourself being those people that we call, we be Utah.